So welcome to this uh, lectures to inaugurate the FC Kohli Center. So today we have with us Cynthia Rudin. Cynthia Rudin is a professor at Duke and uh, to get an idea of her span of interest, she's a professor of computer science, electrical computer engineering, statistical science, and biostatistics and bioinformatics. So she directs the Interpretable Machine Learning Lab, and she's previously been a faculty member at MIT, Columbia, and NYU. So in 2022, Cynthia has received the Squirrel AI Award for Artificial Intelligence for the Benefit of Humanity, given by AAAI, the Association for the Advancement of AI. So this is a million dollar award, so not something to take very lightly. So congratulations, Cynthia. Uh, so she's also the three-time winner of the Informs Innovative Applications and Analytics Award. And uh, she's had numerous other uh, awards to her credit with some of which I mentioned in the bio. So I won't stop us from listening to her. So she is a pioneer in this area of interpretable AI, which is one of the leading areas of interest right now. And she's going to talk about interpretable machine learning for high stakes decisions. So over to you, Cynthia. Hi, thanks. OK, so um, so I decided at the last minute to change my title to 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 interpretable machine learning, bringing data science out of the dark. OK, so I want to start with a question, which is, can a typographical error lead to years of extra present time? Right. This should never happen. Right. Typos, typos are not supposed to make decisions, right? People are supposed to make decisions. Like, who's, is it a judge or a typo who's supposed to make a decision? Um, and is that, is that fair? Um, but it happens all the time. So this is the, the case of someone who is called, he's called Glenn Rodriguez, and he was in prison for many years for a crime he committed as a kid, and he was denied parole because his compass score was miscalculated. And Compass is a black box proprietary model for predicting future crime, and it's used in parole decisions in the United States. And so, yeah, a, um, a typo made a decision here, not a, not a judge typo, and he got years of extra prison time. Anyway, so some definitions. Um, a black box model is a formula that's either too complicated for any human to understand, or it's proprietary, like Compass, where you're not allowed to know what its inner workings are. Um, Whereas an interpretable machine learning model obeys a domain specific set of constraints so that humans can better understand it. All right, so when do we need interpretable machine learning? We need it for high stakes decisions or troubleshooting. So basically anytime it would be really bad if the model went wrong because a lot of times AI models do go wrong and they go really wrong. Okay, so what else could go wrong with the black box, right? We already know that you could get, um, that you could get, get years of extra prison time because of a typo, but but what else? So I put up two of my favorite articles where black box AI models went wrong and no one was able to figure out what happened. So the article on the left, this is from a black box AI model that told everyone that air quality was fine during the wildfires in 2018 in California. Uh, it told everybody it was safe to go outside on days when it was definitely not, like, like people were seeing a layer of ash on their cars. And then over here, um, this is an article about how FDA approved AI models for healthcare are not performing as well as they should be, and no one knows why. So these are this is a model for intracranial hemorrhage, and it was approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Like it's fine, we tested it, and then they launched it in the real world, and it didn't work, and nobody knows why. Um, now I've just I've given you just a few things that have gone wrong with black box models, but. There's a tremendous amount more that could go wrong, and there's probably many things that have gone wrong that were hidden, so I don't know about them. Um, and now, you know, people are starting to use machine learning for medical decision making, for loan decisions and self driving cars, and all matter of other things that you really don't want to go wrong. And some people love their black boxes, they argue fiercely that they need them. Anyway, so I want to get back to Compass. Do we really need to have black box models? Are they more accurate? And luckily, there was a data set from Florida that was released that could tell us exactly how accurate Compass is. So we have Compass scores in the data set, along with basic like criminal history and demographic information from like a few thousand people in Florida. And my lab, um, at the time that that data set was released, my lab had developed this um, algorithm called Corals. So Corals is called Certifiably Optimal Rule List. And CORALS is a very, very complex algorithm, but it produces really tiny little models. 
So we thought, okay, um, let's just see how accurate Compass is compared to corals, okay? So we ran corals on the data set and produced this machine learning model that was so tiny that I could put it in the bottom of a PowerPoint slide. And here's the model. So the model says, if the person is 19 to 20 years old and they're male, predict arrest within two years of their Compass score calculation. Else if they're 21 to 22 years old and they have two to three prior offenses, then predict arrest within two years of their Compass score calculation. Else if they have more than three prior offenses, predict arrest, otherwise predict no arrest. And we just looked at this and thought, wow, that is really small. <laughs> and that this is the optimal model. You can't get you can't get a better model of that form, um, you know, for this data set. And we just thought, like, could this really be as accurate as Compass? And it was. Um, so we always do tenfold cross validation. And so the colors here are from different folds. And what you can see is that the accuracy across folds very, very similar between Compass and Corals. And we thought, okay. Um, well, we're not getting any more accuracy using corals, but why don't we just try unleashing the whole machine learning arsenal at this problem and seeing if we can get more accuracy, and we, we couldn't. Um, and so obviously some of these are complete black boxes like Compass. Um, some of them are very complicated models like boosted decision trees where you couldn't write down the model on a slide. Same with like support vector machines with radial basis function kernels. Like you can't, like it's just too big to even put it on a PowerPoint slide, right? Um, and on the other extreme is corals, whose whole model is right there in the corner. And so we were, we were thinking, well, okay, um, you know, there was a huge debate uh, in the United States and elsewhere about sort of the algorithmic fairness of something like Compass, right? People were debating about like all these fairness metrics. And the truth is that we just don't seem to need Compass at all. So, um, you know, and, and many of you, to be honest, if you are if you are machine learning scientists, right, many of you will not be surprised at this result, right? You will not be surprised that they all perform the same. So wh why not? You know, why why would you not be surprised at this? We found a tiny little model that performs as well as the best black box. So why why you know why wouldn't you be surprised? And the truth is because it happens all the time, right? It's not even unusual to see that all the methods perform the same. There's only certain kinds of problems where there's really a difference between methods. So there's really two types of data that we kind of encounter in machine learning and data science, right? There's tabular data, which is sort of data that looks kind of like that, right? With features and, you know, categorical or real valued values for those features. Um, and all the features are meaningful, right? This is kind of a healthcare example there. Um, that's kind of like what the criminal justice data look like that I just showed you. And, and then there's sort of raw data, which is like images or sound waves or text, um, where, where the representation, you need, to, you need to do something to change the representation of this, of this data, um, doesn't look like that, okay? Now, these two types of problems get handled in machine learning, okay? So for raw data, the only technique that's working right now is neural networks. And that doesn't mean that that's always going to be the way it is, but you have to think about those problems kind of in a different way. Uh, whereas for tabular data, all the methods kind of tend to perform the same, as long as you're willing to do some, some pre-processing, okay? Um, and so what, what that means is that we, we need to kind of think about interpretability differently for these, for these two types of data, right? Because so for, for raw data, we have to think about what does interpretability mean? Um, you know, we're not, we're not sure. For tabular data, we know that all the methods perform the same, and what that means is that there's a potential for very tiny little models to perform really, really well. Okay, we wouldn't we wouldn't have that in in raw data, but we do have that in tabular data. All right, so in any case, the the tabular data here, to me anyway, it it really provides an opportunity for us to kind of see if we can get really tiny little models that are as that are as sort of accurate as the best of the black boxes. But you have to optimize the models really well in order to get up to that accuracy, right? Because there's a combinatorial explosion in the number of small models you could think about. And so you have to, you have to optimize them really well to get there. Anyway, so for the most part of my talk, uh, I'm going to go through three examples, two tabular data, one for raw data. Uh, the first, the, the examples for tabular data uh, are going to be uh, caring for critically ill patients and electrical grid reliability, and these are two uh, examples that um, that I find that I have found particularly interesting to work on. Okay, so let's start with the first example, which is um, 
brain damage and preventing brain damage in critically ill patients. So let's say that you have an aneurysm in your brain that bursts. So you have a hemorrhage, you have blood kind of leaking all over your brain. You have like a blood explosion in your, in your brain. And then you'd be rushed to the emergency room. They would do surgery on you as quickly as they could, kind of patch that up. Then you would be placed in the intensive care unit of a hospital and you would be at risk for seizures at that point. So they would cover you with EEG monitors and they would monitor you for seizures. So seizures are common in critically ill patients. 20% um, of patients get them. Seizures cause brain damage and brain damage can, it, it's quite bad. Like um, doctors will do a lot to prevent you from getting a seizure. They'll like give you medication to try to prevent your, you know, they'll just like, they'll, they'll, they'll actually stop your brain from operating, um, parts of your brain from operating so you won't get a seizure because that, that might, it might actually destroy your brain. Okay. So anyway, um, so these seizures are, are, are quite scary and the only way to detect them is through EEG monitors. Now they also have this problem that the EEG monitors um, are expensive and limited. There's not, not always enough doctors or machines to go around. Uh, and um, people tend to be on the monitors for way too long, which deprives other people of monitors when they need them. So we really do need to predict seizures in advance so we know when to move the monitors around. So I worked with neurologists to design a model called the Two Helps to B score. And it is a machine learning model, but it is small enough to fit on a PowerPoint slide, but it's as powerful as our best black box machine learning models on the data set that we created it from. So here's the Two Helps to B score. And um, it is, uh, as you can see, a risk score. So it has point, points for various conditions. And the points add up to a score, the score translates into a risk of seizure in the next six hours. And it's called two helps to be because it's two H E L P S and then two points for the B. So the doctors can memorize the whole model just by knowing its name. Now, as I said, it looks like a rule of thumb, but it actually is a machine learning model. It was not created by doctors. It was created by data fit into a machine learning algorithm. It um, is just as accurate as black box models for this data set. And it doesn't force you to trust it like a black box, right? Doctors can decide themselves whether to trust it. They can also calibrate the score with information not in the database so that if the doctor looks at the patient and says, oh, this patient has this special thing, that's worth about a point. I'm gonna just add a point to this patient. Um, the score can be explained to non-physicians. You can explain to someone why, you know, their relative is being taken off of EEG monitoring. And as I mentioned, um, this, you know, you look at this model and it looks so tiny and you think, oh, you only had six variables, but no, we had over 70 variables, right? We have 70 variables. We had to figure out which, which six of them and which points and, you know, two Hertz and two points and all that stuff. Like it, it you know, there was a combinatorial explosion in these decisions. Um, so anyway, so, so far, and by the way, this, this, um, this decision, though, it should be a decision of an algorithm rather than a decision of a doctor, right? Okay, so, so far, two helps to be has been um, validated on an independent multi-center cohort. Um, and we, I was not involved in that validation study. What I'm showing you here is the plot of the predicted probability of seizure versus the true probability. And you can see that blue is along the diagonal, which is the initial study. Um, that we built the model from, and then green is the validation study. So it generalized very nicely across hospitals, and that's allowed it to be used on, on many different hospitals, used in many different hospitals. Um, and in the validation study, it resulted in a substantial reduction in the duration of EEG monitoring per patient, which um, really, according to the doctors, has helped them um, um, monitor a lot more patients. Um, they were able to monitor 2.82 times more patients, which helps them reduce brain damage and save lives. So it's a rare example of a machine learning algorithm that's used in a very, very high stakes decision-making setting. Okay, so let me go on to the second example. Can I ask is, a question? Can I oh, ask sure, a question? yeah. So, uh, so finally, you did you arrive at this model by looking at certain kinds of decision trees or what, what did you no. start off with? No? So we arrived at this model by optimizing, um, it's, a, it's a combination of the logistic loss and an L0 semi-norm, which is just the count of non-zero terms in the, um, 
in the model. And then it's there's a constraint which says that the coefficients of this linear model have to be integers okay. um, between negative 10 and 10. And it's a mixed integer nonlinear program that we solved with an algorithm that we developed um, called risk slim, which is a combination of branch and bound and um, um, cutting planes. Okay, so it was an MILP model then. You started off with some mixed integer linear program and then you optimized on that and finally got well, your thing. That's correct, yeah. It's a mixed integer nonlinear program, the formulation, because it's the combination of the logistic loss, the L0 hmm. uh, regularization term, and then the, the constraints that you have to be on the integer lattice. So that, that's a mixed integer nonlinear program. And then we we solved it with this special cutting cutting plane um, technique. Okay, thanks. Sure. I have another okay. question. Uh, oh yeah, go for it. Okay, so, so you said there were more than 70 variables. Uh, so so uh -huh. what's the input uh, to like those 70 variables or these fixed uh, scores? What's the input I mean, to what? Uh, to the model. So the input to the model are all of the variables in our giant table. Right, right. And then we had um, we, we had the outcome, which is whether the patient had a seizure in the next six hours. And, and what were the scores uh, for? The scores were for um, predicting whether the patient would have a seizure True. in the next six hours. Okay, so, yeah. so I'm trying to relate it with the interpretability point of view. So it, it's still, uh, I mean, how is it interpretable? I mean, well, I mean, you can see that it only uses six variables. It uses points that are integers, and you add them up to the score, and the score translates into a risk. So this looks like something that, you know, th this is the whole machine learning model right here. Um, and most machine so learning Cynthia, models... Uh, so, sorry, Cynthia, just to interrupt, maybe to just uh, clarify maybe what the question I'll ask. So is it that these six uh, scored features are a sort of natural subset of the 70 that you get, or are they derived from that 70 in some indirect way? That's the question. They, they are a natural subset of the 70 variables. Yeah, that so in that sense, them. it's interpretable, right? So you're just picking out the most significant six and giving them some coefficient scores. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, so these are meaningful uh, measurements to neurologists who are looking at EEG scores. They look at the EEG and they go, oh, that person has a pattern with a frequency above two hertz. <laughs> Okay, cool. Great, thank you. All right, so let's keep going. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the second example, the shift examples. And um, this is uh, my actually my first job. So my first my first job after my postdoc was to work with the power company in New York City and to rank all the manholes in Manhattan in order in order of their probability to, to explode. So um, in any case. You know these these fires and explosions, like fires and, and explosions and, and smoking manholes. These can be actually very serious, and these um, these problems arise. Uh, so about one percent of the fifty three thousand manholes in Manhattan every year have some kind of serious manhole event, and most of these events are caused by like breakdown of the insulation around the underground electrical cable. So this is all electrical, okay? So th there's electrical cables going underneath the the streets and the avenues in the city and and when the insulation breaks down um, due to like salt um, after a snowstorm or something, then there can be a short circuit and it pressure builds up and you get this. Now, um, whenever there, so, you know, so whenever there's a big snowstorm in New York City, you see these articles about, um, you know, you might expect to see, see something like this, some kind of manhole event afterward. And as you can see, there are many manholes on each street in the city. So each of these dots with the label, that's a different manhole um, in, in, you know, along the street. So you can see every street in New York has these uh, lots of manholes. And then these are electrical cables that go between the manholes, right? That's what all these lines are. Okay, so the data that we had for this project was just insane. It was accounting data from all the way back to the 1880s. So cable data, we knew every cable that was installed, you know, since the 1880s, um, you know, manhole data, where were all the manholes? What kind of manholes were they? Um, we had um, data also from a brand new inspections program. And then the event data was really interesting. So uh, the event data are trouble tickets. So these data were in text documents. So when somebody's like, when somebody's lights go off or, or they, you know, or some of their lights are flickering or something like that. They call a dispatcher who starts typing in the um, ticket while they're directing the action of what to do about it. Okay, so 
the tickets look like the trouble tickets look like this and you know I can read these things now so I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> so this is an example of, of, of our of one trouble ticket. This um, is the front of the ticket and it gives the house number, which is Manhattan 135 6 West 4th Street. Uh, this is an AC burnout, ACB here, um, somewhere near McDougal Street. And over here, um, this is the back of the ticket, which has the remarks. Um, so this, this ticket says that CIB Powers, whoever that is, he's re re he reports a contractor working in service box 15862 in front of 135 West 4th Street has seven wire copper to the west duct. So in other words, there was like some cable that was melted onto the, the duct between the manholes. So the copper had melted itself onto the duct. And then they dispatched this guy, um, Manhattan District Engineer O'Hara, and then he arrived. And then he reported in that service box in front of 135 West 4th Street, have seven wire main in trouble going at the west wall, unable to tell if it goes west or south in the crossing as per the MNS plate. So in other words, this guy is staring at a little map of the three block region where he is. This is a mains and service plate, which is like a little map. And he can't tell where the cable is going. It's melted, but he can't tell where, where it's going. And part of that could be that the manhole is just full of junk and like gunk, like you don't want to know what. And so he had to call in a flush truck that would stick a big tube down into the manhole and suck up all that gunk. So it says flush required. So he ordered it and then the flush truck was still working in the trouble hole. And then he finally got in there and he cut for replacement. These are um, 40 DC cables. These are old cables. And then some AC cables from one service box to another service box. And there's some parking information and then he cleared the burnouts and so on. So I just get a headache thinking about how difficult it was to analyze this data. And my collaborator, who is who is an expert at natural language processing, she says that this is not natural language. <laughs> anyway, so I did what any you know machine learning scientist trained in the uh, you know early two thousands would do, which is take the data and try to stick it into a black box and hopefully get something good out of it. But you know, <laughs> this was before the term data science existed, and and that didn't happen. Okay. So all, you know, all the machine learning methods performed the same and they all did really badly. So in the end, we, you know, we actually developed a very careful way of anal analyzing this data. We processed all the trouble tickets and pulled out all the information into a structured table. We, um, you know, joined the cables to the manholes and it was a, it was a very long process that took three years. Um, and finally, we were able to actually predict fairly well after we did all this stuff. Um, and we did a blind test at one point where the power company withheld data from our database. Um, so this was back in 2006, we made predictions um, on what was going to happen in 2007. We had no data from 2007 in our database. And what we, um, th these are the results of that blind test. So there are 27,212 manholes in the Bronx. And um if there's an x here it means and these are manholes listed from like most likely to explode to least likely to explode okay and then if there's an x here it means that we predicted that manhole would explode and it you know or well we ranked it according to this line and then x means it did explode f means it had a fire and so what you can what you should be able to see from this image here is that if con edison had inspected the top 10% of the manholes on our ranked list, they could have prevented up to 44% of the manhole events that happened that year, okay, if they had inspected that, these 10% of manholes. And um, so it was, this, this is really quite remarkable. And then if we think about, if we went back and thought about like, okay, what helped us make those predictions? It wasn't a bigger and better machine learning algorithm that wasn't what was doing it what happened was that we fumbled over and over again until we could actually understand what we were doing. Um, and we on and the interpretability in the whole thing, the fact that we were designing these little itty bitty models that had like number of cables of, that were old and number of cables at this that this, that understanding was what allowed us to get good test accuracy. Um, and so when people talk to me about the 
um, accuracy interpretability trade off, they always they always talk about it like it exists. And I'm like, no, it's it's actually reversed, right? If you actually want to get good test accuracy, then um, you actually should should understand what you're doing, because in this case, we wouldn't have been able to do it if we didn't understand what the models were doing and were able to talk to the Con Edison engineers about them. OK, so I want to switch gears a bit since I've spent quite a long time talking about tabular data. And I want to talk about um, I want to talk about raw data because raw data is, is quite a mystery, right? Um, the question is, well, what what does it actually mean to have an interpretable neural network, right? Because we know we can only we, we know we only has have one technique that's working right now. OK, and we know that having sp a sparse model just doesn't make sense here. So the question is, well, what what is an interpretable neural network? So we decided we would try working on, you know, interpretability for computer vision. Like, what, what does that actually mean? So we came up with um, with an idea, and I'm going to show you what it is. OK, so this is a neural network that is an interpretable neural network. So in other words, it's constrained to reason about an image in a certain way. And it uses case based reasoning. And so what the network does is um, it's classifying this bird. OK, so why is this bird classified as a clay colored sparrow? And it says, well, I'm going to classify this bird as a clay colored sparrow because I think me, the neural network, thinks that this part of the bird up here looks like this part of that bird. And this is a prototypical clay colored sparrow. OK, so it makes this comparison. And then it says, well, I think this part of the bird, you know, this little edge of the bird's wing here in the belly looks like this part of that bird. And that's a prototypical clay colored sparrow that I've seen before because it was in my training set. OK, and this looks like that and this looks like that. And it gives a score to each comparison that it makes. And then it um, all these scores get added up. OK, so every calculation here is um, something that either a human can check, like whether this really looks like that. Or it's a linear model. OK, it's, everything can be can be checked by by a human either visually or by adding up some stuff. Now, because this model does this looks like that and this looks like that and this looks like that, um, we called the we called the method, we called the paper this looks like that. And um, what it does is it takes your favorite black box and it adds an extra layer to the neural network that forces the network to do case based reasoning. OK, and the and the prototypes are learned during training. So in other words, even those prototypes that I showed you on the last slide, they are learned by the network during training. So in other words, you take your favorite black box, standard convolutional neural network, and you transform it to be interpretable by um, adding an extra layer that forces it to do this kind of reasoning about parts of images and you know, for, forcing it to do comparisons to these prototypes. Now, we usually have 20 prototypes per class. That's a parameter that the user can choose. And the network scans the image looking for parts of the image that look like each of the prototypes. So I'm going to just zoom into sort of this whole part of the network right here um, and just show you what this computation actually is. OK, so this is um, an example of the network classifying this bird as a red bellied woodpecker. And the network said, well, I think this looks like that part of this bird. And it gave it a similarity score of 6.499, which relative to the other scores is quite high. But this is quite remarkable. I mean, the bird has a bright orange head and it has this sort of white pattern on its face and like a little black, like little black stuff over here. I mean, this is really quite a remarkable similarity between these two birds. So it gave it a high score. And then um, there's another number here, which is sort of how important this bird is to the um, red bellied woodpecker class. Okay, it's a um, just a weight for that prototype. And it does this for all 20 kind of prototypes for this class and adds up the numbers and gets this score over here. And it does this for every class. It tries to get as much evidence it can, as it can for this bird being that class. And the next highest class was the red cockatead woodpecker. Um, but here you see that that it wasn't able to get very many points because these birds don't seem to have red heads. And so um, it was only able to gather points based on sort of patterns in the feathers and, and stuff, um, which didn't give it as many points. So it says, OK, I think I think this is a red bellied woodpecker. And it doesn't always get everything right. I mean, it, it does make mistakes, but you can kind of see where it 
made the mistakes. So here's an example where we trained a DenseNet 161 model with the extra prototype layer to make it a proto PNet. And then it took this bird and it misclassified it. Okay, so we're trying to figure out why. So it gathered as much evidence as it could from the correct class. It's looking at sort of the bird's eye and carefully avoiding its head. Um, and uh, it, it gathers information from the feathers, but it really thinks that maybe this bird looks more like a prothonotary warbler. And to be honest, after looking at the prothonotary warblers, it really, I mean, to me, it looks very much like a prothonotary warbler. Okay. So anyway. Um, so so, so, I, so one minute, I, I have a question. So when you say these uh, prototypes, so how many classes did you have? And uh, how many prototypes? Uh, so you said 20 prototypes. Uh, were learned, but how many classes did you have? 200. 200. So, so you're actually learning uh, 20 into 200 prototypes in some sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, this is an example where it misclassified it, but, and as I mentioned, you can switch out the, the base model. Um, so here uh, we switched it to VGG 16, which actually got it correct. And if you look at what VGG was looking at, it's still looking at the bird's eyes and its beak, but you can see that it avoided the bird's head. And so I think what happened here was that this bird, it's, it might be a baby Wilson's warbler. So apparently most Wilson's warblers have a black, very black spot in the front of their head. And this bird doesn't have that. So I think what happened was that it just couldn't gather the evidence using this sort of spot. And that's why it ended up looking like prothonotary warbler to the other network. So anyway, um, yeah, so this is 200 classes of birds. This is a benchmark data set in computer vision, by the way. This is where like people just train deep neural networks and- um, Cynthia, you know, just a question in the chat. One second, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. So yeah. somebody wants to know whether there is a, whether this looks like that approach would be able to handle adversarial attacks. Um, or is I it susceptible to adversarial I attacks? If yeah, so robustness is different than interpretability. So if you want it to be robust to adversarial attacks, you have to do the same sorts of things that you would do to a regular neural network, right? You would have to sort of, um, you know, train it with a lot of augmentation and, you know, whatever. But you you could actually find cases. I'm, so I, we haven't done this, right? But I'm sure you could find cases where, um, like, that where this would not look like that. And then it would gather some high number of points, but then the human could say, "Oh, I see where the, I see where the, um, you know, the attack happened. It's in this part of the image because this doesn't look like that, you know." So I think it's possible that you could do adversarial attacks on this, and and you know they would be successful. But then the interpretability would help you figure out what happened. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, okay. So anyway, yeah, we've we've been training um, this this proto peanut on this, these benchmark data sets to see if we lose accuracy over the black boxes. And we just don't. So um, the black box accuracy is between these numbers. We trained a whole bunch of black box models. And then um, once we made them all proto peanuts, the accuracy remained within the same range. And then when we combined a whole bunch of proto peanuts together, we got even a higher accuracy. And, and we still got an interpretable model because it was still using case-based reasoning. So um, even for computer vision, we, we still have an interpretable model as the same accuracy as black box. So I've really yet to find a domain where I actually need a, a black box, right? This is, these are problems where the deepest of the deep neural networks are trained. So in any case, we're in the process of trying to apply it to um, computer aided mammography, which is like, it's kind of like the ultimate in computer vision challenges. Um, so uh, a standard black box approach would take a breast lesion and it would just sort of predict, you know, <laughs> predict, you know, let's, here's the lesion. I'm a black box. I predict benign. Why? I'm not telling you. Uh, and then if you use like a saliency map approach, like kind of like an explained black box approach, what they usually do is highlight the part of the image that they think is important. And I find this very unsatisfactory because all it does is highlight the lesion. And it's like, great, thanks. I knew where the lesion was. That's why I gave you the image. So it doesn't really tell you anything. Um, that you didn't already know. Uh, and the method we're, we're doing uh, is quite different. It actually, you know, compares different parts of the image to these prototypes. And it tells you, well, you know, I think this part of the image looks like this. And so I'm going to add, you know, 
half a point to the malignancy score because indistinct margins tend to be malignant, um, whereas this part of the lesion looks like a circumscribed um, lesion, and that actually would subtract points from the malignancy score. So in any case, um, this paper was just published very recently, and, and we're very proud of it because I, we think it provides a new standard for what people should expect from um, interpretable deep learning models for radiology. Sorry, I have one more question. So are your prototypes also invariant to transformations like rotations or something? We do augment the data set so that we include um, transform we include um, transformations. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've so far given you three examples, two from tabular data and one from raw data where we didn't find any loss in accuracy for using an interpretable model. Okay, so I want to point out that interpretable machine learning is different than explainable machine learning, right? Interpretable machine learning is where you don't have a black so, box. So, Cynthia, sorry, sorry, before you start on this, there's still a question about the old part. I'll just mm -hmm. ask you that. So, uh, you mentioned that you had used different base models uh, and augmented them. Uh, so, the question is asking whether the Mistakes that were made were different or they were similar? Uh, among the different black boxes? Yeah. You mean like, sorry, so you mean? So I'll asking... read out the question and you can see, interpret the question for yourself. <laughs> so for different models on the same data as in black box versus derived model, were the same cases assigned similar outputs as in the no, bird no, scenario? No, or did you have... have different cases, cases where different images were assigned incorrectly over different models? Yeah, different different um, models get different things wrong. So I even gave you an example of that a minute ago, where like with this example over here, where the dense net one sixty one, when we trained it with Proto Peanut, it got this it got this wrong, and whereas the VGG actually got it right. So you do find a lot of examples where the networks just predict differently. That does happen. Yeah. Okay. And nice. you can see these. You know, these are the accuracies here. So. You know, they're not perfect accuracy. It's actually really hard to do this because some of the birds are like obscured or some of the birds look like other kinds of birds. It's really hard to tell the birds apart. So you will find different um, models predicting differently. Okay, cool. All right, so as I mentioned, interpretable machine learning is when you use a model that's not a black box, whereas explainable machine learning is when you use a black box and explain it afterward. when you do some post hoc analysis. So you would like start with a black box and then you create another model that approximates it you compute derivatives of it, or you visualize what part of the input the model is paying attention to, and so on. Okay, so there's really quite, a, um, th these sound the same, and they even use words that mean the same thing, right? Interpretable, explainable, right? So how can we tell the difference? And why are we using the same words um, when, um, you know, I, I claim these things are quite different, right? I, I claim that there's a real chasm be between these things. And why is that? Um, I claim it's because we don't need black box models in the first place. So as I showed you, even for computer vision, where you think that you would need to use a black box and explain it, um, even there we can have models that are interpretable, inherently interpretable. And these explanations, they actually just lend authority to the black box and they're flawed. Okay, so, um, I'm going to give you an example here of where, um, you know, I mean, it's true that in many cases we're using these complex or proprietary models when we don't need them and, and explaining them just doesn't seem to be helping us. So I wrote a paper back in 2015 um, called Interpretable Classification Models for Recidivism Prediction. So this is um, predicting recidivism, which is when someone commits a crime after they're released from prison. And here, um, what our paper said is that we don't need a complicated model to predict recidivism. You're not going to benefit from the extra complexity here. And we also showed that race was not a useful factor in predicting criminal recidivism, right? Race, race is correlated with age and criminal history due to systemic racism in society. But once you take those into account, there's no more benefit from using race. Okay. So then it was to my complete surprise when ProPublica wrote this article the following year saying that Compass is this you know, black box used in the justice system and it, and it uses race. And we thought, what, 
you know, what's going on here? Um, you know, compass black box uses race, right? We don't need either one of those things. And that's what our paper said. So after some thought, we finally published an article showing that Compass probably doesn't use race other than through agent criminal history. It's just that ProPublica explained a black box wrong. And that's the danger of um, trying to um, explain a black box. Like you can accidentally cause a scandal and you know maybe get nominated for a Pulitzer <laughs> in the process. Anyway, that they actually did get nominated for a Pulitzer because of this article. But anyway, I think the real problem is that Compass isn't interpretable. Um, we don't really need complicated models for recidivism anyway. So let me give you a little bit more detail on what happened here. So um, something you need to know is that explaining a black box, right? That's that's not the same, you know, with an approximation, that's not an, the same as explaining what the black box is doing. Okay, if you create, if you have a black box and you create an explanation for it, which is an approximation, even if these functions are about equal, they could rely on totally different variables. Um, so it's possible that your explanation might rely on age number of prior crimes and race. And then you might conclude that the black box depends on race, but the truth is that the black box may only depend on age and, and number of priors. And you could say, well, this sounds like a silly mistake, like, like I can't believe it would ever happen, but, but that's exactly what happened in this case with the ProPublica article. They actually explained Compass by approximating it and then the approximation depended on race. And so they claim that compass depended on race. Okay, so here's that article. Um, this, is, uh, this is what they, what they claimed. Um, and um, so let me go into a little bit more detail about what exactly they did. Okay, so what they did was they showed that the false positive and false negative rates of compass varied by race. They suggested that that might not be a good comparison they should include age and number of priors and re-examine because they're correlated, like I said, with race because of systemic racism. Okay, so then after including age and number of priors, they still found a linear approximation to compass with a low p-value for the race covariate. And so they concluded that compass depends on race. And the problem, of course, is that I don't think compass is a linear, has a linear dependence on age. And so their conclusion um, doesn't seem to follow. So let me just show you how bad ProPublica's assumption really was. Okay, so I'm going to show you the data from Florida um, that was used in the ProPublica piece. And we, we just plotted that data. So this is age versus compass score. And I hope you can see that this, this like there was a fairly sharp cutoff of compass score as a function of age. So like people who are 20 years old are not getting scores that are like negative four here. Just not going to happen. And there were a few outliers. I mean, maybe some like typos in the database or something, but like overall not pointing to a linear function of age, right? There's no linear function of age that, that could really do it. And it looks like compass kind of depends heavily on age here. So, you know, if they messed up age, this could, this could really mess up their analysis. All right, so what we did was we subtracted this function here that I have in orange. We subtracted that off from compass. And then we were wondering, well, okay, if we're actually going to try to figure out whether compass depends on race, let's just subtract off this dependence on age, right? Because we think this might be how compass depends on age. Um, so we subtract that out and then try to figure out whether the remainder depends on race, but it didn't seem to. And we figured that out by running machine learning methods with and without race to see whether they need race to predict compass well, and they perform similarly. So race doesn't boost performance. Um, so just like in our interpretable recidivism paper, ProPublica's conclusion just, you know, just doesn't, doesn't really hold. And so we were wondering, like, if race doesn't actually appear in Compass, other than through its correlation with age and criminal history, then how did they find these pairs of people, right? How did they, they do that? Um, you know, these examples were key evidence on how Compass depends on race, right? Because, um, like, the white person had, like, a longer criminal history and a lower um, score than, than the matching Black person. But you see, if you look at these two people, the black person is much younger than um, the white person. So, you know, if compass depended heavily on age, then that could totally explain how this happened. And, you know, Vernon Prater's old, so he doesn't get the age points. Now, I'm not saying I agree with this, but if they had compared two people of the same age, then this, I think, would have been a lot more convincing. 
that compass depends on race in addition to this very strong dependence on age. Um, and so ProPublica's claims, right, not really holding up well with respect to race, like compass might not actually depend on race, but there's actually a much worse problem with compass that ProPublica completely missed, which is that, you know, humans are not very good at in inputting data reliably. <laughs> so if you have like 137 factors entered by hand for each survey, which is, you know, a compass survey is, is quite uh, big, then if you have a 1% error rate, then you would have a 75% chance of at least one typo on each survey. And so that's just a serious disadvantage to any kind of complicated or proprietary model, um, which is, you know, that's what caused the issue with Glenn Rodriguez, right? We were, um, you know, it's just that, that typos happen, people make mistakes, right? So if you're using a complicated pipeline, it's more prone to having more mistakes. Okay, so in any case, we were wondering um, how often this happens, right? Because this seems to be like a major disadvantage. Um, so we took the Florida data and we tried to figure out how often these typos might happen. And we found some very strange inconsistencies. Like here, we found that, um, you know, if you look at the compass violence decile score, which is like, these are the people, these are people with the lowest possible compass violence score. The scores range from one to 10. And these people have the lowest score. And some of these people have this very extensive criminal histories, right? Like battery on a law enforcement officer and driving under the influence and carrying a concealed firearm. Like, I would not expect people with the lowest violence score to have this kind of criminal history. So the only way I can explain this is by some kind of data error or data issue. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, by the way. These are people with compass scores of two and three. Um, and you can just see they have, some of these have like extensive numbers of charges and past arrests. We even think we might have found um, we might have found even typos in the documentation of, about Compass. So Compass claims it's linear as a function of age. Um, we think, obviously, as I showed you, that Compass is a nonlinear function of age. So anyway, we published this article um, attacking both ProPublica for um, explaining a black box wrong and Compass for being a black box where typos cause decisions. <laughs> And the, um, the editor of this um, paper, the famous Zhao Meng, um, found several uh, amazing people to write articles, kind of commentaries on our paper. These are from like famous um, criminologists and, and, and sociologists. And one of these articles though, is from the people who created Compass. And they wrote an absolutely scathing article saying that Compass is interpretable, which is pretty funny because if that were true, it would have saved me and ProPublica a lot of trouble. But in the mountain of criticism here, they admitted a couple of things that were super interesting. Like they wrote here that the authors, so us, that we've taken a clearly informal description of the violence score in the practitioner's guide. And the guide was not intended to be a technical document. It was an equation. I don't know how more technical you can get. Anyway, they wrote also um, discussions of appropriate variable transformations are beyond its scope. And we note that the skewed, skewed aged variable is an ideal candidate for a normalizing transformation. And we were like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe we actually sort of got them to admit something here. Um, and then um, in terms of transparency, they wrote that they're pursuing copyrights for these formulas. So in other words, they, maybe they do plan to release them. And I, we thought, whoa, this is like, this is a big deal because this is determining people's freedom here. And it would be nice if they did release that. So anyway, um, I finally got sick of people explaining black boxes. And I finally wrote a paper telling people not to do it anymore um, for high stakes decisions. And the arguments are kind of what I um, just showed, told you. I'll, I'll run through a few of them. Um, first, there's not really any scientific evidence for a general trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. So I've, I've showed you examples even in computer vision where um, we don't find any trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. And in fact, the trade-off is reversed for problems like um, power grid reliability, where um, understanding what was going on helped us actually perform well. 
Um, and then even for deep learning and computer vision, right, interpretable models can be built at the same accuracy as a black box deep neural network. Okay. And for tabular data, most machine learning methods are equally accurate, including sparse models. And explaining black box gives it unnecessary authority because you think you understand it um, when the truth is, um, you know, it, you may actually just have completely messed everything up. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted to say today. So, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Cynthia, wonderful talk. So some questions already came in, but anybody have more questions on this, please feel free to ask. Yeah, so yeah, Mina. Yeah, uh, thanks for the lovely engaging talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm wondering about uh, whether you think that, so you mentioned that there's no scientific evidence for there being a trade-off. But if I just imagine, let's say, trying to explain driving to a friend, a very bright friend who doesn't know how to drive or any other advanced skill, like maybe baking or chemistry or something, I will have to say a lot of very many complicated things. It'll probably take more than a few pages to explain all of the things. And that's just, that feels like that's some evidence of believing that highly complicated things do exist and humans do tend to learn them. And it's hard for them to interpret themselves as well. So I would imagine theoretically, it is quite likely that a lot of things are just not amenable to interpretability based on this argument. So, is this a good argument? No, I, I don't agree. So, um, okay. So first of all, a lot of the examples you gave weren't really machine learning models. And I'm just talking specifically about machine learning, but also you're saying like, you know, drive teaching people to drive as a black box, but it's not because we, we teach 16 year olds to drive all the time. In fact, every 16 year old who has a driver's license has somehow learned to drive. So I'm not, it's, and you know, cars were built so that they, they could be interpretable to humans, right? You give them commands like, you know, you turn the steering wheel and it goes left. So these are things that are interpretable to humans. So um, I'm not sure kind of really what, you know, what, what your point is there. What I'm trying to say is that even though these are interpretable, they're sort of like, really really long list of interpretations whatever's going on in a 16 year old's mind mostly some kind of unsupervised learning in his own brain right and when i think about like the example you gave in the beginning of the 2h help to rule it was limited to like six variables and that makes it easy for a human to deal with easy for a human to grasp easy for a human to remember uh if it allowed all 60 variables it might like you said, in that case, there was not really an accuracy trade-off. But we're saying that if you just came up with a model with like 60 variables and each one of them had scores, that would count as being slightly less interpretable, I, I would guess, if you have like a full list. So I'm just talking about this sort of, like the You're more- You're talking about sparsity. To, yeah, right, yeah. I'm talking yeah, about sparsity. So, right so now, sparsity yeah. is one form of interpretability, but it's not this, it's not equated to interpretability, right? You can have models that are, so for example, for loan decisions, you might not want a model that depends on six variables, right? You might want to have a model that decomposes into sub models, and then each of those sub models depend on four or five variables or something like that. And then you combine the models in a way. So like sparsity is just, it's just not the only notion of interpretability. There are lots of different notions of it, and it just depends on the context, which, which, what interpretability actually means. Um, I have a right. review paper that might be helpful. Yeah, I, I probably want to give other people a chance. Uh, yeah, uh, let me just, thanks, yeah. Let me just thanks, grab Mark. this review paper, and then you can um, you can take a look at that because it has it has a lot of definitions in it. Um, yeah, there you go. Thanks. Yeah, going back to the manhole problem that you mentioned. So how uh, that that of course, as you said, it required a lot of data cleaning actually, uh, and uh, I mean, to get to something which is interpretable, perhaps that is uh, at least on data which is tabular, which has been collected in some way. Uh, that that seems to be. I mean, is there a way to automate that 
cleaning process or one has to do it the hard way um well i i i'm not sure i mean i think for this particular problem like even though we had hundreds of thousands of trouble tickets that's mm -hmm. not going to be enough to really um you know, you wouldn't be able to sort of feed it into a giant neural network and get it to produce anything meaningful. You know, there there are things you could potentially do, like you could, um, um, I mean, I you could potentially do like some kind of word embedding thing, but I, I don't see that that actually would give you any benefit for the effort um, than just simply doing what we did, which is using regular expressions. Um, you know, it, it's just such a complicated, complicated problem and the terminology would vary from trouble ticket to trouble ticket like sometimes they would say you know manhole number one but what they really meant was manhole the first manhole they were dealing with not the manhole whose number is one they wanted service box three five six two two or whatever it was so there were a lot of like things you had to read into these tickets um, and really understand what they meant in order to process them effect effectively okay okay thanks a lovely talk very nice talk Thanks. Mother, I had a question. Can I can I ask? Is there time? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Cynthia, hi. Really nice talk. So, in your first model that you showed, corals, which was, uh, uh, you mm -hmm. know, so there you said that the only the priors were part of the information, which kind of depended on the race implicitly, and you didn't have any explicit race factor, right, in the in the model, and you still matched very well with the compass. But I was wondering if you do put like race as a factor also explicitly in your corals, then does the matching with compass improve or is not substantially changed at all? I mean, there were some error bars. So, I yeah. sure. race, so race was a factor that corals could have included, but it chose not to. Okay. And the you, you showed a table about the, where you showed that the people with violent scores on compass had very uh, you know, serious crimes. Uh, uh, they had low scores, very low scores, but they were involved in very serious crimes. But was there a correlation with race there in the table? I mean, I didn't see that uh, race of the people were known. Oh, you know something? I didn't even I didn't even look at that. Um, well, part, you wouldn't be able to tell it from our tables because we changed all the names to protect the. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I I don't know if we even kept the. I don't even know if we kept the nationalities when we changed. I mean, we we sort of tried to keep the names similar, but like. They're different, so we, it's not really clear. I think it's going to reflect more sort of who's who lives in Florida than anything else, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's also it's also kind of too small of a sample to really make that conclusion. But what you can say um, that's very relevant to your question is that you know if there is a noise if there is a level of noise in the compass scores that affects everyone uniformly in the justice system yeah. it's going to affect some races more than others simply because who enters into the justice system is based on race yeah. you know it's like if the police follow around certain groups of people those people are more likely to end up in the justice system right. and then right. those people are more likely to be subject to typos making decisions for them so in that sense race is is heavily involved, but it's not, it's not like the algorithm's fault necessarily, aside from the fact that the algorithm's a black box. So in that sense, yeah, okay, maybe it is, maybe it is the algorithm's fault there. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I had a question if we have a couple of minutes. Sure. Yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, my question was that you, what you're doing is fundamentally suggesting like a completely new way of um, training machine learning models and asking, like introducing ideas to make them more interpretable, which changes the way you train them. And uh, is this only possible for like new models that we're constructing or is there a way of setting out to do this from the very beginning, like making this the goal of my machine learning model from the very beginning? That, like are there ways to make it more interpretable, the design itself? Um, so, okay, so I've given you a few examples of, inter of interpretable models. I've given you um, scoring systems like the two helps to be score, which is a linear sparse linear model with integer coefficients. Decision trees, which corals is a type of decision tree. It's a, it's a rule list. Um, I've also given you these interpretable neural networks that do case-based reasoning. 
but there are many, many other types of interpretable models. So that review paper that I have put there um, is it's a review of 10 different problems that are like important areas in interpretable machine learning. So even within the field of logical models like decision trees, you can have um, also decision sets. You can have, oh, oh, there's lots of different logical models that you can construct. Um, there are a lot of different variations too on case-based reasoning. Case-based reasoning, I think, is sort of an all-powerful, you know, it's just, you can use it for anything to do anything. It's, it's incredible. Um, and now it sounds like nearest neighbors, but the truth is it's, it sort of goes way beyond nearest neighbors. Um, you can also have models that are decomposable, like I said, so you take all the variables and then you break them into groups and then you work with each group separately. That might be useful for, for sort of blending decisions or genetics. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I do, believe, I do believe that there are many, many different ways to construct interpretable models and you should pick the one that works for your domain. Yeah, I have one uh, kind of trivial question. So in your uh, this vision uh, model, you uh, the prediction came from prototype right because similarity matches right so would say say so suppose i learned embedding and give while inferring i just uh, measure the distance between my uh, input to its embedding and then produce the result would it be considered as interpretable enough because um, in the end I'm so that's thinking, that's yeah. what our thing does right so our, our what i think does is project everything into the latent space and that uses utility and distance in the latent space Yes. So it does learn the distance metric, but it's checkable by a human. That's the thing. A human can say, yeah, that does look like that. Or no, that doesn't look like that. I don't trust you. <laughs> okay, that's, not, that's not what I meant by that. So, oh, uh, so in, in that only, in that, uh, in uh, this look like that only, uh, you're just uh, measuring some similarity between your input and some prototypes learned, right? that's uh, that's interpretable uh, at least from that definition so say i uh, inject everything into latent space and just match the similarity between my input and like uh, whatever classes are there would so so my answer uh, my uh, prediction would be my closest uh, kind of embedding in that latent space so but like is, the problem with doing that i mean so so people have done that. There's like deep KNN, right? Deep, deep K nearest neighbors, those kind of papers. But the problem with doing that is that since it doesn't break down the image into parts, you don't really know what part of the image it was looking at. You know, you don't really know what caused it to be over near this class. True, true. Well, I mean, like the, the, the definition itself of interpretability kind of, you know, uh, deviates away from the decision tree to uh, this vision models and little models. Yeah. I mean, from a decision uh, tree point of view, you predict something because you followed this particular path. And then here we have that because of these similarities between my prototypes and my image, you are getting this result. So, I mean, is there yeah. like a general consensus where uh, you know that this is the definition of interpretability. No, 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 definitely not. And there can never be any any consensus because different problems require different types of interpretability. Um, and for computer vision, I should point out that so our method, what it does is it does all these comparisons, right? Um, this looks like that. This looks like that. And then um, it does a linear model at the end. But other groups have like there's a couple of hundred citations on the paper already. And so a couple of groups have done is they replaced our linear model with a, a decision tree and their model their model some some of it seems to work better than ours according to their paper so i think there are definitely like ways to build on on these techniques and, and design all different kinds of interpretable models but at the uh, end you would still like something which is in some sense succinct right because otherwise it looks very hard to be human interpretable also because if it's not then uh, as you said, if you can check, yes, that, uh, but uh, if you give me hundred prototypes and ask me to check, that seems a bit too much. So there has yeah, to be some notion of succinct, succinctness also in the final interpretation, right? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, so if you're adding things up or doing, you know, logical models, like humans can handle what seven plus or minus two cognitive entities at once, right? That's what that mm -hmm. old paper said. So like, you know, you do have to, you do want to keep the humans um, kind of levels um, of, of you know, what, what they're keeping track of fairly sparse. Um, but you, you know, when you think about sort of visual comparisons, those aren't sparse. So, um, 
So you just have yeah. to think of the ways that humans process information and think about like, okay, well, you know, is this acceptable or, or not? Mm. Yeah, that's true. Okay, cool. Thank you, Cynthia, for a wonderful talk. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.